Our world has moved into a phase where we see new technology that fascinates us every day. For example, NVIDIA has developed an AI that produces highly detailed images of human-looking faces, but the people depicted don't actually exist. While AI-created faces are absolutely remarkable, they are also incredibly eerie. These are faces that you would believe to be real people had you not known they were actually machine-generated. In the artistic front, we have the drawing tool Pix2Pix. It's an image-to-image -image translator where an image is synthesized from a drawing on a canvas. It's pretty interesting to see the generated images adding texture and depth perception based on pencil strokes. This type of synthesis is not only localized to image data. In September 2016, Google's DeepMind released a paper on WaveNet. It's a speech synthesizer that generates voices that are nearly indistinguishable from human speech. The primary tool used in all of these applications are GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And that is what we're going to talk about today. The idea of GANs was conceived in 2014 by Eon Goodfellow. So why do we use them? There are many times where we just don't have enough data to create a model. GANs can learn about your data and learn to synthesize or generate never-before-seen data to augment your data set. Consider them as an approach to unsupervised learning and even semi-supervised learning. I say this because semi-supervised learning is used when some of your data is labeled while the rest are not. We may have a labeled data set, but it may not be enough to train a model. In this case, we could generate unlabeled data using GANs, and so a semi-supervised approach is appropriate. Furthermore, the generated data could also be just used as is, like in the examples I mentioned before about face image synthesis. So we got the generative part of GANs. What about the adversarial part? When I hear the term adversarial, I think of reinforcement learning and gameplay. So who exactly is competing against who? A basic GAN consists of two models that play against each other, a generator and a discriminator. Think of the generator as the robber, or more accurately, the counterfeiter, who tries to replicate the input data to produce counterfeit data, or fake data. The discriminator, on the other hand, is like a cop who needs to be able to distinguish between the real data, which is from the data set, and the counterfeit data, which is produced by the generator. The loss of the discriminator is used as the objective function for the generator in the next time around. Now we have six basic steps to train the GAN. So first of all, is define the problem. What exactly are we trying to do? Do we need to synthesize images from a caption, or do we need to synthesize an image from another image, or audio synthesis from sentences? What is it? The next thing we need to do is to define the architecture of your GAN. That is, answering questions like, what is the generator? What is the discriminator? These are basically modeled depending on the complexity of the problem. Is it a multi-layered perceptron, a neural network, or a simpler model? The third step is to train the discriminator model to distinguish between real and fake data. When we speak of training, we need to feed it both types. We need to train it from the data in the data set and label it as real data. And to train it against fake data, we feed it fake data generated by our generator or the counterfeiter with the label fake data. In step four, we need to train the generator now. So this uses the loss of the discriminator as the objective function to the generator. In other words, we need to modify parameters of the generative model to maximize the loss of the cop, or the discriminator. We then repeat the training of the generator and discriminator over n epochs. After every iteration, the generator will get better at fooling the discriminator. Finally, the discriminator will not be able to tell the real images of the dataset from the fabricated ones by the generator. Once the training is complete, we synthesize data from the generator, and this can be used to augment our true dataset or just use as is because it's really cool. So now we know the basic components of a GAN and how it works. That's great. 
Now let's get some more intuition on the loss function for our discriminator. The discriminator uses a cross entropy loss. So why is that? For one, it's because that we are dealing with a classification model. Cross entropy loss is a better performance metric than classification error or mean squared error, MSE. Classification error computes the number of samples misclassified, but does not take into account how off those predictions were. It only cares about the end classification result. In cross entropy loss, on the other hand, it is possible to have a model which misclassifies samples more as a better model, simply because when it was wrong, it wasn't really wrong by that much. Another reason for cross entropy loss in neural network architecture is to eliminate the vanishing gradient during training. In other words, the change in the weights does not become zero when using cross entropy error loss and hence training is not stalled, so to speak. The cross entropy loss between the true distribution P and estimated distribution Q is given by this formula. P and Q are thus vectors of M dimensions, where M is the number of classes. Now, a given sample can only belong to a single class. So the true distribution is a one hot vector with one one and the rest zeros. This is because we are certain that this sample belongs to a specific class. The discriminator in a GAN is a binary classifier. It needs to classify data as either real or fake. So in this case, M is equal to two. And the true distribution is a one hot vector only consisting of two terms. So we can write the equations as shown. This represents the loss for a single sample. We can sum over the losses for N samples to get the overall loss. Now we know that half of the samples come from the data set and the other half is from the generator. In other words, we have half of the samples that follow the distribution of the real data and the other half of the samples which follow the distribution of the fake data from the generator. The tilde sign represents is distributed as in mathematics. Let D of X be the predicted classification of the discriminator. Since we don't know how the samples are fed into the discriminator, it makes sense to mathematically represent them as expectations rather than sums. And so we end up with this form. If you find it hard to remember which term of the expectation is distributed from the real data and which term is from the generator, take a look at the D of X term. This is either zero or one, depending on whether it predicts the data as fake or real. Consider the first term with just D of X. When does this term contribute to the loss function? So it contributes to the loss function when it is not zero or when it is equal to one. And this happens when the data is real. The expectation of DFX when X is sampled from the generator would have been zero and hence it isn't included. Now the reverse is true for the next term one minus DFX. This term contributes to the loss function when it is one or when DFX is equal to zero. In other words, when the data is fake and data is fake when it is sampled from the generator. By the same argument, the expectation of one minus DFX when X is sampled from the real data would be zero and hence it isn't included. I hope that was more of a comprehensive explanation of the loss function. So now moving on, what are the types of GANs out there? Well, the first one is the original vanilla GAN, which I just outlined above. But what about something a little more complicated, like deep convolutional GANs, DC GANs? When we think of convolutional neural nets, we tend to think about labeled training data and supervised learning. However, DC GANs demonstrate expanded use of convolutional neural networks in unsupervised learning by using CNNs in generators and discriminators. More specifically, consider the problem of generating images of faces like we see in NVIDIA's AI. The discriminator will take an input face image, either from the generator or the actual data set, and output real if it believes the image is that of an actual face, or fake if it believes the face is not that of a human. It is a binary classifier that can be implemented with convolutional neural nets. 
The generator, on the other hand, will be given some data as input and will have to come up with a face. Now this is done through a deconvolutional neural net. The next type of GAN that we have are conditional GANs. We know that GANs are a novel way to train generative models, but the type of data generated by the generator can be anything. What if we input a condition that could dictate the type of image generated? This could be done through conditional GANs. To give you a better example, consider the MNIST dataset, which consists of images, digit images, 0 through 9. A typical GAN would be able to generate random digit images, but through CGANs, we can specify a condition for the generated image. This condition is the label digit in this case. So by feeding the digit 5 to our CGAN, we can generate an image with the digit 5 in it. In other words, we can direct the generator to synthesize specific images. Another type of GAN that we have is an info GAN. So this type is not only able to generate images, but also learn meaningful latent variables without any labels in the data. One example given in the paper is that when an info GAN is trained on the MNIST dataset, variables representing the type of digit 0 through 9, the angle of the digit, and the thickness of the stroke are all inferred automatically. Here's an example of a possible output when a salient variable is varied over every row. You can see that as the variable value changes, there is a difference in the thickness of the brush stroke. Another type of GAN that we have is the Wasserstein GAN, WGANs. One of the main problems of GANs and DC GANs is the objective function of the generator. Recall the objective function is to increase the loss of the discriminant, but there is no clear sign of when to stop. You need to keep looking at the samples and see if they are satisfactory enough to pass for real data. The old method of minimizing generative loss was through minimizing a metric called the Jensen-Shannon divergence. It is a method of measuring the similarity between two probability distributions. This new Wasserstein GAN, however, seeks to minimize a new metric called the Wasserstein distance between points in the probability distributions. Using the Wasserstein distance, you can train the discriminator to convergence, and this leads to higher quality generated data samples. I'll link the main paper and a more accessible blog post to this in the description below. There are many other GANs out there, and it is a very hot topic of research now. Consider, for example, Microsoft's Attention GAN, that is, Attention Generative Adversarial Network. This paper was released a few days ago. This Attention GAN can create images from text through natural language processing and performs fine-grained tasks like generating parts of an image from a single word in the description. It is able to do this through an attention mechanism, where the generator focuses on generating parts of an image or data in high resolution and other parts in lower resolution. As the context of the words becomes more known, the surrounding parts of the image increase in resolution over time, until finally, we get an image that closely corresponds with the words in text. There's so much fascinating technology sprouting from these GANs every day, and it is an exciting topic to discuss, and there's so much potential. We'll come back to this topic in a future video. I'll include a list of links to papers and interesting blog posts in the description down below. I'll also include cool application links like the pix to pix application, the hand-drawn image synthesis tool. Thank you all for stopping by today, and if you liked the video, click that like button and subscribe for more content on data sciences, machine learning, and deep learning. D did you click subscribe? Please click subscribe.